<laughs> oh. Think of it like think of it like landman for access control. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, it's it's broken. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a quick overview uh, of access control systems in general just so you've got a bit of a backgrounder. And then I'm going to take you through some credential technologies like prox cards, swipe cards, some biometrics and their kind of basic workings. So I'm not going to go too deeply into how a fingerprint recognition algorithm actually works, but just an overview. And then we're going to actually start to look at a worked example of biometrics, how it actually goes about doing it, and we'll take you through their uh, common flaw. Okay. So... And by the way, I do tend to get ahead of my mouth, runs ahead of my slides, so you will probably see this happening quite a lot. Okay, so here's a basic access control system like you'd expect to see. Uh, this reader could be a swipe, it could be prox, it could be a biometric reader like fingerprint. Uh, traditionally, in a basic system like this, uh, you've got a, a single access controller. Uh, electric lock and normally a push to exit button. Occasionally you have other exit devices such as passives mounted above the door, passive infrared sensor, so that when you walk up to the door it un unlocks. And that can be a, a whole world of, uh, of pain in itself because uh, waving a bit of uh, mylar underneath it will quite often just pop the door. Slightly more sophisticated systems actually have a local door controller, which talks to the access control system. Quite often the access control system simply pushes the credentials, i.e. the uh, user IDs, the card number, to the door controller, which remembers it. In this situation, we've got what's known as anti-passback. So both sides of the doors have readers. So you authenticate to get in and you authenticate to get out. Basically, so you can't slide your card back under the door and let someone else in. It can be a problem because occasionally it gets screwed up and you get users that either can't get out or can't get back in. So, not ideal. Uh, okay. So, as far as physical tokens got, we've got your MagStripe card, pretty common. The YGAN card, a little bit outdated these days, but still used in, in kind of places like airports. London Heathrow was all YGAN card authenticated. Prox cards, which we're all familiar with. Uh, Barium ferrite card. Now, this was the original card key. They're not really used that much these days. Uh, concealed barcode card, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, smart cards. And uh, we'll start with our concealed barcode card. It is as crappy as it sounds. <laughs> Basically, uh, you have a barcode and then you have uh, IR translucent material that just looks like a black stripe along the bottom of the card. Hold it up to any bright light and you will see the barcode. Put a bright light above the barcode on a scanner and... Uh, you'll just be able to, to image the barcode right off. It is fucking embarrassing. <laughs> so, basically, if you find anyone that's ever implemented one of these systems, uh, I suggest that you fire them and then shoot them so they don't infect anyone else. So, mag stripes, again, we're all pretty familiar with. Normally three tracks, uh, two types of cards. So you've got high coercivity cards and low coercivity cards. So basically how much magnetic energy 
it takes to actually align the particles on the card. So credit cards typically are local. Things like uh, your Cal State driver's license is a high coercivity card, so you can't just pop it through a regular uh, reader writer and, and write that. You need a special high coercivity uh, card writer. Uh, exposed head in the reader, which means it's yeah, dossable quite easily, actually. And there are certain high security cards. The hotel locks in this hotel are considered by the manufacturer to be high security. Now, uh, you'd be surprised. So basically that means that in general, uh, a regular card reader writer won't be able to duplicate them. But that can simply be as, as easy as just adjusting the track offset so the tracks don't line up where they would normally do on an ISO standard card. Uh, they also use slightly different modulation techniques. So it uh, by no means high, high security. It's certainly duplicatable, but just not by your standard card reader writer. The Max, Max Frights basically use a protocol called clock and data, which is pretty simple. You've got your, your clock pulses along the top, your data pulses along the bottom, the presence of a, a 1 or a 0 with a clock pulse indicates your data stream. This is actually a bit of my Visa card, actually, but only a small bit. Uh, <laughs> I hasten to add. Uh, no significant digits there, but, but you can clearly see there's your, your clock along the top and your data bits along the bottom. Barium ferrite cards not really used that much anymore. They were the original card key cards. So it tends to be an insertion reader, but I've, ha I've seen readers where you hold the card up against a little metal plate. Uh, and it has what you could only describe as a fridge magnet inside, which has these discrete magnetic domains. So basically, if you have a bit of paper and you pour iron filings over, that's, that's what you're going to see. And the original card key, as I mentioned. Wigan cards, a little bit more interesting. There is a special wire uh, which is actually coaxial, it's done by special forging, and has this magical Wigand effect, uh, which everyone thought was really cool at the time, and non-duplicatable. Of course, they never really thought you could just take an existing YGAN card and reorder the, the bits. But uh, So basically, if you look at the card, you'll see little bits of wire embedded in it. Uh, so that pattern, just remember it, because we're going to be seeing a lot of it. And basically, the top row is ones, the bottom row is zeros. Or either way, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's what a card looks like. That's what it looks like when you, you hold it up to the light. So you can clearly see the wires embedded in the card. And basically, what the Wigand effect is, is when you wave your special bit of Wigand wire past a magnet in it, which is polarized in a particular direction, it charges up with magnetic field. Uh, and when you wave it, next to an oppositely polarized magnet, it dumps its charge. And if you happen to have a convenient little coil nearby, you can actually read that pulse. And that's all that's happening. When you swipe your card through the reader, there's two magnets for each row. One charges the wire, the other discharges it next to a, a little coil. So. Once you swipe your card, what you actually get is the, the Wigand electrical protocol. There's basically three wires, a data one wire, a data zero wire, and a, a ground wire. And these tiny little pulses are effectively what you'd see as you swipe the card go down through the reader. So you've got your binary one here. It's 40 microsecond dip and there's a two millisecond gap. 
between the, the next pulse, and then your 40 microsecond dip, and then a 2 millisecond gap, and that's, that's it, really. Quite simple. There is quite a lot of variance in that. The particular reader that, I'm, that I have here happens to do this. Some, I've seen this be as high as 100 microseconds. You know, it, it's, a, it's quite flexible as a protocol. So this is actually what it looks like when you, uh, if you hook it up to a logic analyzer and you run a card through. It ha doesn't happen to be this card, but as you can see, you know, it's identical pretty much. This is important, so you need to remember because this is what we're going to be looking at later. The next thing we've got is the YGAN format. So generally, if you go out into a store and say, oh, I want a, a YGAN prox card, it will probably be 26 bits. They'll ask you, oh, what facility code would you like? Uh, and that ranges from 0 to 255. And then they'll, they'll give you a range of cards, which you, you can specify quite often. So it's actually 24 bits because you've got a parity bit at the beginning and a parity bit at the end. And that's what makes up a, a YGAND ID. They will, manufacturers of cards will quite often say, right, I'll tell you what, we've got this super secure version, which is actually... 36 bits, and uh, we don't sell the site codes to everyone. We'll, we'll give you your own site code, and we won't sell it to anyone else. So just remember, when you're buying your 26-bit card, quite often there's a, there's a chance your next-door neighbor might have the same facility code, and therefore might have duplicate cards. Prox card, which we're, we're all aware of, they're passive, so it takes its energy from the reader. And basically, powers the card up, and the card barfs back a data stream. And it does it, this, uh, when you hold a prox card up to the light, it looks exactly like that. You think there's a little strip of wire, wire four wire antenna in there, and a chip. Actually, it's a coil of a bazillion turns of the finest wire you will ever see. So basically, it powers up, it's magnetically coupled, and it bars back a data stream. It takes 506 bits across the air interface to hand over a single 26-bit ID. So there's a lot of redundancy in it. OK, don't get prox cards and RFID cards. People use the term interchangeably. They're not. Proximity cards are magnetically coupled. They've got to be close to the reader and able for, for them to work. Uh, and basically, when it's transmitting the data back, what it, what it actually does is it shorts its own coil. It's got a tiny capacitor in there to kind of keep it alive. It shorts its own coil out, which is effectively killing its own power source, but it causes a tiny volts drop in the coil that's actually powering it in the reader. And that's how it actually singles, signals back. So basically, through this magnetic coupling. RFID cards basically are true little radio transmitters. They take a radio signal, and typically, they transmit their response on a different frequency. It tends to be half the frequency that's used to energize it. Okay, see what I said about my mouth running ahead of my slides? Okay, contactless smart cards. In my view, the way to go. Uh, they tend to have, they tend to have decent crypto screens. They authenticate the reader. So if you have a standard prox card reader, it will read pretty much anyone's prox card of that frequency. So you can you know, stand behind them in the street and you can read the data off their card. With contactless smart cards, there's at least some authentication. You can't do that. Uh, we'll get into 
there's a bit of a problem with them, and we'll get into that in a minute. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown of biometrics. Uh, there's my favourite, and this is by far my favourite, the retina scan. Uh, iris scans, which are really popular in the news at the moment. A new one that's coming out, which is a, a venial hand map. Uh, hand geometry, another perennial favourite of mine. And uh, the old fingerprint. So fingerprints are simply a capture and compare. Two technologies in general use, optical and your semiconductor capacitive sensors. I'm not too keen on the, well, I'm not too keen on either of them, simply because the semiconductor one can be very easily damaged by static electricity. It is literally a single semiconductor field. Uh, so you can zap that one really easily. Easily defeated, as we all know, gummy bears, lick photocopies, silicon fingerprints, it's, they're, they're not that hard. The important thing is that they're all images. So generally, th this is what a fingerprint breakdown looks like. And the technology, depending on which algorithm it's using, will look for particular things. So it might map all the ridge endings in your finger, or it might look for bifurcations or islands. And everyone has their own <coughs> scheme. Uh, there is no kind of standard way for, for recognizing fingerprints, which means some vendors' technologies might be far more secure than others. Hand geometry scanners. I actually have a few of these, simply because they're, they're quite easy to use, though not foolproof. Again, it's just an image capture. This is actually quite a nice image of what this device is actually capturing. And the smart guys added a 45 degree mirror in its field of view. So now they can claim it's a 3D hand, hand geometry scanner because it, it takes a side profile. I thought, yeah, well, I, I thought it was quite a nice hack, but still the marketing department got hold of it. It's like, yeah, it's now hand key 3D. <laughs> Venial hand scans, which I haven't actually had a chance to play with. Uh, pretty cool. It takes an infrared image of your palm. I've seen, seen them do it with hand geometry scanners as well, where it's doing both a hand geometry and a venial hand map. And uh, apparently someone's come out with a finger venial map, which I'm not sure how many veins are in the end of my finger, but hey, apparently enough according to them. We'll see. But again, the important thing is, it's just an image capture, and that's what all biometrics tend to, to end up with. So your iris scan, again, just an image. But the scary thing is, potential for walk-by capture. I, I think that's this particular unit, you used to have to spend a lot of time aligning yourself, which is a, a problem with all biometrics is alignment. And they came up with this little scanner that you don't actually have to spend ages messing around with to align yourself. So you just kind of glance at it. It recognizes your pupils and takes the scan from that. My fave, retina scanner. One of the more secure ones. It's quite hard to steal credential because basically you have to get up close and personal. It's hard to use. I mean, literally, when I say you've got to be trained how to use a retina scanner, you do. It's easy to, uh, to screw it up, even if you know what you're doing. Manufacturer went bust, bit of a bummer. <laughs> but I did snap up two of them for 76 bucks on eBay, which was quite nice. Uh, Okay, so we're, we're, I'm going to use this as a, a, a good example of how biometrics work in general. So, first of all, the user enters code on the reader. Any biometric technology that 
says, hey, my voice is my passport, recognize me, is doomed to failure. Never, ever, ever implement it. Basically, what you want to do is you want to match up a template, a known template that's been recorded by your security administrator with you. So normally it starts off with you entering a code on the reader. And on a retina scanner, it displays a target, a visual dot. The older ones had a, an array of a nice little line of green dots that went into infinity, and you'd kind of line them up so you could only see one. The newer ones, uh, like the one pictured there, has a little green dot, which you superimpose over an orange dot. Here's a tip. If you're ever using a retina scanner, put your finger on the scan button before you line up because you're going to need to press it yourself. <laughs> so you look into your eyepiece, you shiggle your head around to your, you're only seeing, you're seeing your, you know, only seeing your single dot or your, your little green dot is spot on over your orange blob and you press the scan button and then you freeze because a retina scanner actually takes a little bit of time to capture. Under a second, but it's like, don't move. Incidentally, I got my first retina scanner from a booth that was a standalone access control system for Hanford, which manufactures weapons-grade plutonium. So you'd scan, ooh, scan, sorry. And when you step back to, to find out what happened, the booth would actually weigh you. And if you were heavier coming out than you were going in, the, the door stayed locked. In fact, both stores, doors stayed locked. Uh, I did the boys with the guns came. So, not that easy. And they all have a variance factor because everyone changes a little bit. You know, I, the staff here gorge themselves on Krispy Kremes this afternoon. Tomorrow they'll be slightly larger and that changes things. All of a sudden, bits and pieces that the biometric expects to be in one place, slightly further apart. Uh, if you load up on water, again, things change. If your head is slightly, oh, you, don't, you weren't quite standing quite straight, you were slight, slightly angled, again, different. So they all have a fudge factor. You never match your biometric 100%. And quite often, when you look at these, these readers, if you've got slightly more sophisticated device, uh, when you scan yourself, it will give you a score as to how closely you matched your ideal biometric that it recorded. And the systems administrators can tweak that so they can say, right, well, if you get within 30%, it's okay, but yeah, 35 isn't. Sometimes there can be a lot of variance because people don't know what they're doing, basically, when they're setting these systems up. So, and again, the, the stricter you make it, the, the more rejects you're going to get with people trying to authenticate and failing. So, here's a retina. And imagine that I've just looked into my retina scanner and I've aligned my uh, little dots. Press the read button, and what happens is it scans a, a circle around my retina, which is effectively what a retina scan actually is. What happens is it takes that image, it flattens it out, and but as it parses it, it notices that here, oh, it got a little bit darker here. Oh, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. Surprisingly enough, on the original retina scanners, the credential was 360 <laughs> bits long. I, they did start hashing this on later... Uh, 
later models, but uh, it just, just shows you, it's like, uh, how are we going to do this? These people you think are really, really smart aren't quite that smart. You think, oh, well, if he's designed a, a retina identification system, got to be great, but maybe not. So, my fave, I have to say, certain problems, alignment, it's totally subjective. So, if we just skip back to that, that spot, that spot may be optically, just where I dropped it on, on this image, I've said, oh, it's going to be in the center. But with you, it might not be the center of your retina. The center of your retina just might be here, as far as you're concerned, in your, in your view. So when you see movies where someone pops someone's eyeball out and holds it up to the retina scanner, totally, totally, totally bogus. Because A, even if they could align it so that the, the target ends up spot on in the center of the retina, it might not be the center of the retina as that user perceives it and as they aligned it when they were registering it with the system. So almost like having a brain print because basically it's how your brain, how the, the neurons wiring the retina to your brain actually decided it was going to, uh, that was going to be the center. Again, you've got your fudge factor and IDs end up as a hash, which is not always a good thing. So false acceptance rate. I, people that really care about this are the military, i.e. they really don't want, they'd rather we had the false rejection rate was high, i.e. someone didn't match their valid scan, than to have a high false acceptance rate where someone that shouldn't be allowed in suddenly is. And again, they're all coupled with the user ID. So, a bit of a problem with biometrics. How do you revoke your credentials? <laughs> <laughs> Which is not nearly as bad as the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> bit of a problem. It's like, oh, someone's, someone's duplicated my retina. What am I going to do? Uh, well, you're screwed, basically. So, there is a bit of a catch. And... It's about backwards compatibility, really. And also market forces. The great market force. Wigand. Wigand cards? The bollocks. These are the most secure things ever when they came out you know, back in the 60s, 70s. And all the access control manufacturers said, right, we want... You know, Wigand came out. They didn't make access control systems. They made the cards and the readers. So... Basically, everyone wanted to interface with Wigand readers, and they still do. So everything we saw, everything we've just talked about, from the retina scanner down to your standard proc swipe, they all use Wigand electrical, the Wigand electrical protocol and the Wigand data protocol to signal back to the controller. And that's a little bit of a problem. It's plain text, pretty much. It's easily intercepted. It's even easily, more easily replayed. You've got your output from biometrics and includes the output from your strong crypto readers. A lot of them have Wigand output on the back. Some smarter manufacturers are starting to move away from this, but it's a huge problem. So the goal of my little project was to record Wigand IDs and to replay them and to be small because basically it needs to intercept the physical wiring behind the reader and be easily installable and to be cheap. Would be nice. Problems. Well, once it's in there, how do I actually control it? How do I get, get it to replay IDs? How do I make sure that the, the, the ID I'm seeing is actually good. And if I want to get the data out of the device, how do I actually do it? Again, don't want kind of wires hanging about. 
So, basically, this is what a, a reader, a standard reader, would look like. You've got so your uh, positive and negative, which is dead handy because it gives me power. And then you've got the data 1 and data 0 lines, which are transmitting the actual YGAN data. And quite often, you've got an LED, which is driven by the access control system, that just basically makes this go green when you're allowed access. So, this is Gecko. It's really small, it's really cheap, and uh, it uses command cards. So basically, it has its own little set. So it's its own tiny access control system. It's own, its own little set of cards that it knows to look out for. It uses the access allowed LED, this one doesn't, but the, uh, the V2 one does, to, uh, to actually say, oh, I've just seen a YGAN ID go past. Oh, and the access allowed LED went on. So it's a, it's a good, good card. And it actually, again, this is coming in V2, it uses the access allowed LED to get the data out of the reader because I'm using a PIC chip for this, and they're quite handy because I can say, Pin 5, you're an output pin and you're currently driving that LED. Oh, you're now a serial port, 9600 bits per second, 810, no, and here, have this stuff to send. So basically, I have a little optical reader that you hold over the LED, you swipe your dump card, and it will just read out its entire contents of memory. And it just splices in like this. It's really small. Uh, this has quick connects. So basically, uh, video man, if you're about, I'm going to pass. These are, these are artist renditions, but basically, the, physically, they're identical to this. So I'm going to pass a few out, and you can just pass them around so that people can actually kind of see what we're actually dealing with here. Uh, so. I'm going to give you a quick demo. Standard disclaimer applies. If Locke is in the room, please leave now because he's been jinxing my demo all weekend. So I'm saying right now it's not going to work, but just in case it does, I'm going to take all the credit for it. So, here is, oh, the nice thing is, is uh, here's the actual device I'm talking about, and uh, this was my artist's rendition before I started, and it's actually just a little bit smaller. So, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny little access control system. You've got your reader, and as I said, this particular one doesn't monitor the LEDs. Uh, so that's what this yellow line is. This is simply to drive the LED on the reader. And here we have our power and our data zero and data ones. So it recognizes two users. Whoops. Use, see, that's the lock effect. <laughs> so, user Adam and user Zach. And a bad user is denied. So, what we're going to do is we'll just pop our device in. As you can see from the units being passed around, the quick connects are open, so literally it is as easy as cutting the wires and just crimping them in. All these readers tend to have pigtails rather than connectors, so it'd be easy to do. Also, the connectors are the single largest thing here. The, the pick chip in here is an 18-pin dill pick chip in a socket, so it's huge com compared to what it could be. If I went surface mount, it would be a lot smaller. 
and it would be completely, completely dwarfed by the uh, connectors. So, user Zach, user Adam, bad user, just do user Zach again, yeah, are we working? Yes. And now I have a card here which previously wouldn't work. This is, actually, I, should, I knew I was missing something. I keep telling you I run ahead of myself. So I have three other cards here which uh, I didn't show you, but I will now. And we'll just leave them here for the moment. So, bad user. User Adam. And user Zach. The cards on this side. Nope. So they're all not recognized by this access control system. Believe it or not, quite a lot don't actually bother monitoring, and it's as, it's as simple as holding lines high when you're connecting it. So bed and nails, you just hold the lines high. There's, there's nothing there's nothing smart happening here. Uh, one of my favourite access control systems is actually manufactured by Hirsch. It's a system I use, and it uses quotes strong crypto to talk to its uh, its its readers. Uh, it is likely to spot things like that. Uh, because it's constantly talking to the readers. But basically, no one else does that. You know, they're just sitting there. Lines are down. Okay, so... Bring it back up. So we have... Oh, we have our bad user. We have user Adam. We have user Zach. And then we have our previous card, which didn't work, which is this one here. Oh dear. This card is the replay card. Now, there are another two cards here. This one here, for example, quite handy. It didn't work for a reason because here's user Zach and user Adam. But user replay. So we'll use our magic enable card. Let them back in. So now user Zach. Uh, so basically, there's a whole raft of, of handy other things you can do. This was, a, this was a pick. So I have a dump card, which will dump stuff out to the LED. I have some program cards. So I have a program, I have an end program, and I have a one and a zero. So you literally can go program one, zero, one, zero, 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 zero one. And, uh, and get your ID in there. So, it did work. This is uh, what happens when you look at the protocol analyzer and you can see that the, uh, this is the ID of the card that was actually swiped, uh, the last few bytes, or bits, should I say. And you can see that the card that's transmitted to the, the reader is completely different. Uh, albeit not that different because I happen to use all my cards in the same batch. But, uh, so the scary thing is, is it took 12 hours to do. It was literally that simple. Included 
learning the IDE and how to program PICs, which isn't hard at all, not when you write it in 6K of PIC Basic. <laughs> uh, it's got a very basic feature set, and you've seen the disable. Version 2, which I'm working on at the moment, various PIC chips either have, uh, there's, there's a whole range of them, they've got different uh, features. Some have got built-in EEPROM, most of them have got built-in Flash. Uh, they check the validity of the card by monitoring the, the reader LED, so there's a slightly better one here, which is a, another connector on the top which intercepts this LED line. Uh, that's my fave. It is serial port line 5, clock the data out, and it will load the data via the command cards. Version 3, I'm using a Bluetooth <laughs> interface. Uh, you can get a device with a Bluetooth pick. It's larger because of the... Uh, that, it will work with... Obviously, have, you have no way to control it. That's, that's a good way of doing it. And then version 4. That little guy is not just a GSM phone. So this is the GSM antenna. Uh, this is a GPS antenna. And it uh, is fully programmable in Python. <laughs> uh, and they cost about 50 bucks. So... Uh, so yeah, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of fun to be had. Now, as for these readers, uh, basically were you screwed by two screws and a plastic cover? Because basically, that's literally all it takes, two screws. So that about wraps it up. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, you're welcome. So, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Sorry? Do you have a development kit? <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't quite decided if I'm going to release it or not because A, it was so easy to do. I mean, it is criminal. You should learn how to do this. Pick chips are fabulous. Uh, it's, I mean, it is, it's not hard in any way, shape, or form. I, this, this little circuit here has some supporting hardware, like a little crystal to, to give the, the chip its timing. The only reason I did it on this one is because I happened to have a pick lying around that didn't have an internal clock. I mean, literally everything's there. Hardware serial ports built in. They're really, really easy to use, shockingly so. I mean, if I can do this in 12 hours, and I generally am not renowned for my coding, uh, anyone can. Anything else? What do the vendors think of you doing this? <laughs> well, the problem is, is it's not there isn't a vendor that is uh, dealing with this. Everyone has implemented the same. Uh, but it's the same thing. It's just couple of pulses going down two wires. So it's a bit of a problem. Everyone, I mean, most of these readers have no, if you buy an alarm device like a passive or a, even a little junction box, it will have a tamper switch built into it as, you know, as part of the device. Not one of these readers that I've ever looked at has any form of tamper switch at all. Some of the biometric devices do, but they're worth stealing. Uh, I spoke to some uh, locksmiths, and they said, oh, well, it's easy. You just put tamper-proof screws in. So it'll be really obvious when you destroy it, taking it off the wall. And I'm like, okay. So I destroy it, taking it off the wall. They're like 20 bucks on eBay. I'll just put a new one back in. 
the other thing, the other thing it does raise is this particular manufacturer, who I won't name, uh, has has its own command cards. So when you power one of these readers up for five minutes, it goes into a, oh, you can program me mode. And it has its own little set of command cards, surprisingly enough. Uh, so I've got a card that will turn the beep on and off. I don't want my beep to beep. Boom. We have a card. doesn't beep anymore. So how do you know that this feature isn't already in your readers? Because, hell, if I had access to, to, to their microcode, it certainly would be. So, you know, how much do you actually, how actually, much do you actually trust your uh, access control vendors? You know, with, uh, I shouldn't really mention this to some people with rampant paranoia, uh, but uh, it's like, you know, it could very, very easily be compromised already. So. Uh, some uh, keypad readers use YGAND, some are really dumb and they just have a contact closure on the back. So some, some keypad readers are actually kind of smart, they talk YGAND to a back-end access control system and some are just literally locally programmed and uh, if you actually were able to get behind the keypad you could just short out the, uh, the contacts that would actually open the lock. Well, if you had a look at the ones uh, that are floating about, all you have to do is cut four wires, poke them in the end there, crimp, poke them in the end, and crimp, and that's it. Plus the screws, plus... plus the, yeah, plus taking, a, uh, you know, how long does it take you to take a light switch out of its socket, put it back in? Well, now you want, you want to put it back, but, I mean, the, all of these kind of fit standard J-boxes. Just... When you walk around the place, have a look and see how many of these are sitting, guarding doors with, you know, no camera backup. They're just, you know, sitting in the, the back of an alley. Yeah. Or do it in the day. Just say, oh, I'm here to... I, when I told one of my mates about it, he said, uh, oh, why don't you just put a manufacturer's label on it? Just call it a power filter or uh, yeah well it all depends when and where the readers are I mean the classic place is the uh, is, is Smoker's Corner, round the back. Every building has one, especially in California. It's like, and in the UK now as well. So there's a, you know, there's going to be a door. It's going to, be, it's going to have a reader on it. And, uh, you know, it's going to be in some little place because they don't really want people to see all the smokers. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a classic. There's just have a walk around and have a look and see how many exposed readers there are. This is a PIC, and it's a 16F627. Six, six uh, and it is just one PIC and the connectors. Yeah, it is that embarrassing. So some, some of the, this reader, and most readers will do from 5 to 12 volts. If it is a 12-volt system, the signaling always goes back, certainly in my experience, at 5. So you may have to uh, add in a, a little voltage regulator so you don't fry your PIC. But they're the size, uh, you know, TOS package, they're the size of a transistor, so 
Our client? Well, incidentally, this, this is timed down to uh, the nanosecond. And my timings are actually better. They're more accurate than the reader itself. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit, but they're more accurate. And, and if I actually made my device slightly larger and included a little ceramic resonator, clocked it slightly faster, I could make it even more deadly accurate still. So, I mean, uh, the only kind of hardware used to develop this was a, was a programmer. Sorry? Uh, you, just use, uh, you just use bed of nails to hold, hold the voltage up. The signals, it signals each bit, is it dropping it drops for a bit, so it's at, so its standard state is held high. So you just hold it high while you're doing the install, uh, and no one's going to be any the wiser. I mean, pick programmer, 50 bucks, looks like that. And I actually used a little logic analyzer to get the timings perfect, but uh, that is the same one you used. And uh, this one was about 300 bucks, but. Basically, you can get really, really, really cheap only. I mean, this, this has like 34 ports. You can get you know, one or two port logic analyzers or little USB scopes really cheaply as well. So not expensive at all. Yeah, but the thing is, it's, it's really, really close to the end. And... It's, it's not, it doesn't look like a tap because it's actually intercepting the signal and terminating it effectively. So, I mean, no doubt, if you're actually actively looking for this stuff, then it may be possible to detect it. But the bottom line is, uh, 90, or I wouldn't even say 90, I'd say probably 98% of access control systems don't even bother with this sort of stuff. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, putting it at the J box. I mean, if you if you're outside a building, then uh, accessing that door is is kind of number one. Uh, once you're in, then I mean, you could read it, read out the data. Uh, there are other uh, devices for cloning cards, so. Rather than trying to find users, it would be quite easy to install one of these at the ex or one of the external readers, just read a whole bunch of card IDs, and then once you've got them, just emulate the cards. But if you could just walk me through getting into the building and then getting access to the box, what well, would be your, quite, quite, what would be your time frame between starting the attack and finishing it? Quite often. Sorry, this, this is generally mounted on the outside. So I'd, I'd be at the service entrance. It's how long does it take to, to pop the cover off? Two screws. You cut, crimp, crimp. So I, I would say three minutes or under. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if you practice, you could probably do it really quickly. One, one of the problems with this is people think that, that the actual security is in the card, not in what's, what's going back and forth. So they've made no attempt to really secure. I mean, if it was me, it would be you know, tamper switch to hell. I would be talking crypto from here, or ideally from the card, back to the access control system. Sadly, no. Sorry? Uh, they'll, they'll normally use just shielded Cat5, Cat6 cable. Uh, yeah, and, and, and 
some, some places will do if it's particularly exposed, but again, you know, two screws and a plastic cover, that's, that's what's stopping you getting behind the reader. Any more questions? Then I commend you to the bar. <laughs>